I feel a little top heavy. Oh, honey, you are a little top heavy. <laughs> The cult classic Valley of the Dolls is one of those films that's so bad it's amazing. Hi. Since the 1967 release, scathing reviews have never dampened audiences' so. warm embrace of this movie. They love me. It was an instant hit, based on the smash bestseller by Jacqueline Suzanne, and the film has inspired myriad remakes and re-releases, attracting crowds with a Rocky Horror-style ritualistic dress-up and quoting, and it was recently accepted into the Criterion Collection. The story of three friends in the 60s undone by Hollywood and dolls or pills taps into some deep truths about female bonding and today's celebrity culture. So how did this bad movie become a bona fide classic? Critics panned Valley of the Dolls with memorable vitriol on its release. And I am doing my best exercise. Roger Ebert particularly hated the vulgarity of this scene. Go to hell with them. Let them droop. And the cliché of this one. It's all right. It's all right. There's also scenes Tony. like this. Why is nobody helping Tony. her? And why does Barbara Parkins' Anne walk barefoot in the snow and do this when she's sad? At the end, Anne leaves her own house to reject Lion's proposal, and the final shot is her happily playing with this stick. She even picks up another stick first, but apparently it's not a good enough stick. Best of all is Patty Duke's badly behaved Neely O'Hara, delivering up some of the most delicious overacting this century. Neely O'Hara! There's also the constant repetition of this song. When will I get off? Got me to get hold, I went wrong. Yet audiences love Valley, precisely for all the badness just mentioned. I'm pregnant. You know how bitchy fags can be. That impossible magic of delightfully bad comes from Duke's committed outbursts, the pounds and pounds of wigs, and the non-stop motion of a plot where lives deteriorate and monstrous problems pop up at lightning speed. Sharon Tate's charisma and the public's fascination with her life after her tragic murder by Charles Manson cult followers also add to the film's mysterious draw. The film's attitude to sex feels retro for the swinging 60s. While the movie hints constantly at sex, it does so through silhouette and wind in the curtains. Ebert, who ended up co-writing the satirical sequel Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, called the movie a dirty soap opera. Dirty, quote, not because it has lots of sex in it, but because it firmly believes that sex is dirty. Good girl Anne spends a large chunk of the movie feeling bad about giving up her virginity to a guy who won't marry her. No, some men just don't pull well in double harness. Well, how do you think I feel sneaking out of your apartment at 4 o'clock in the morning? Everyone feels sad that Jen's forced to do nude art films, and the movie implies that sex is degrading and ruining these women's lives. Boobies, boobies, boobies. Nothing but boobies. But on closer examination, the backwards feelings about sex could be more reflective of women's dilemmas than they seem. The Valley women want sex just as much as the men, but they can be trapped and disempowered by having it. And honey, let's face it. All I know how to do is take off my clothes. Whether it's the impeccable 60s makeup and hair being so really? distracting, or the general sameness of the characters, the movie's overall effect is disorienting. Funnily enough, while complaining about the dropped purse scene, Ebert's review misremembered the character in that scene as Neely. Ebert also freely admits he can't tell the men apart. And there's the strange mix of time periods. The hair, makeup, and clothes are distinctly and fabulously 60s, but they're mixed with lingering elements from Suzanne's book, set in the 40s, like the old Hollywood studio system's practice of treating stars like properties and pumping them full of pills. Neely is partly based on Judy Garland, who reported this treatment from MGM in her rise to stardom in the late 30s and 40s. Underneath the unsophisticated writing, we sense juicy reality lurking. Author Suzanne, who chased Hollywood fame before she started writing novels, used her roman à clé as a thinly veiled tell-all about her showbiz acquaintances. Anne Wells was based on B. Cole, though many viewers see her as a Grace Kelly. Anne's undying loyalty to the agent Lion Burke, who won't marry her and totally out of nowhere starts sleeping with her best friend Neely, is inspired by Lee Reynolds, whose agent husband had an affair with Judy Garland. Tate's beautiful, fatalist Jen, only valued for her body, Mother, I know I don't have any talent, is often taken for Marilyn Monroe. 
but she was actually based on 1940s pin-up Carol Landis and showgirl Joyce Matthews, who married and divorced both Milton Berle and Billy Rose twice. Jen's breast cancer diagnosis comes from Suzanne's own life. Jen's singer husband Tony was a spiteful version of Dean Martin, while the impossible diva Helen Lawson was based on Suzanne's frenemy, Ethel Merman. Even if modern audiences won't remember all these names, we sense we're seeing a window into the dirty underside of showbiz. Also not to be underestimated is the catharsis we feel watching this takedown of the rich and famous. Valley predicted society's escalating obsession with fame. The movie is a precursor to gossip magazines and Real Housewives docu-soap style reality shows from an age before these things existed. These pills are really great, Jen. They kill your appetite. The women's slang for their pills, dolls, comes from dolaphine, a brand name for methadone. But it plays on the association with a child's toy. Using these dolls is a childlike crutch, regressing to a state of dependency. Also like playing with a toy, fame culture is getting attached to something not real, built on collective imagination. As she chases her childish desire to be worshipped and adored, You don't know what it feels like now when they're all applauding and yelling and whistling. Neely feels less and less satisfied by her star status. I am a big star. <laughs> I tell myself that, Annie. But I don't feel it. Since doll is also a slang for an attractive woman, the title also refers to the women who are victims of a shallow culture that uses and discards them. Is this a dream? As a genre, the female-oriented melodrama is dismissed and belittled by critics. It's over-the-top, histrionic, silly, yet many of us just love it. It's no accident that the book and movie both hold special interest for women. It has also appealed to the LGBT community, who kept the movie's cult status alive for years. The only real value in Jen's, Anne's, and Neely's lives is their ongoing female friendship. So maybe the film does capture something real of the female experience, of romantic disappointments and the consoling power of friendships. Valley of the Dolls isn't a Criterion classic because it's an example of expert filmmaking, but because it's a powerful cultural artifact. The enduring love for this film has proven that it speaks to us, in spite of or because of its badness. Thus, the charisma of the dolls lives on, now as a classic movie. You think it's a hit? It is with me.